podcast, Picks and Perspective, with Chris Johnson. Mike. Hey, Chris. Wow, you got the setup. Of course you do. How you doing? I'm great. <laughs> Good. A little yeah. bit of, I was a little bit out of sorts. I thought when you texted me, I was like, oh, shit. It was, is it now? Is it, I, had, I thought it was an hour off <laughs> from... Uh, and I was like, oh, man, that's, that would just be perfect for today. I would totally do that today. <laughs> Daylight like, savings. I'm not used to it either. Yeah, no, it's, yeah, I've been sleeping early and waking up in the middle of the night and just making music. That's, that's, that, <laughs> makes, that makes sense. You know, coffee, <laughs> weed. Ah, it's 3 a.m. Fuck it. Right. Whatever. You make your own hours. That's right. Yep. Oh, man, it's good to see you. You too. How you doing? I'm uh I'm hanging in there. It's been a roller coaster, like yeah. I think for most of us. Um, Absolutely. But it's been a minute. I think um, last I chatted with you, I was still in L.A. And, and you're, you're you're in Corona now? No, I'm in Chico. Oh, okay, okay. Yeah, far north. This is like kind of my hometown area. So uh, when the cor- when the Corona thing hit, right. uh, I just was like, I, h- I held out for a little while longer in Hollywood and. Then I was just like, ah, and there's racial tensions and cops. It like all this stuff. I was like, okay, maybe LA is not the place for me right now. Well, yeah, you you go where you're comfortable, right? So um, yeah, you you're having a good time there. Yeah, I mean, this is it's familiar ground. I get there's lots of space to ride my bikes, and mm-hmm. uh, I mean, the biggest deal is that for the same price I was paying for. Uh, a cockroach infested uh, mother-in-law unit in East Hollywood with packs of dogs on either side of me and helicopters constantly circling overhead. I have a three bedroom, two bath uh, house here, you know, with a garage and a backyard and my neighbors are all sweet. So that's huge. Yeah. Yeah, it really is. I I, I didn't realize that there was such a discrepancy. That's, that's incredible. I mean, I'm sure it's getting this, this is expensive for here for some people, but like, living you know just i just thought well you know why why move into a tiny place when i could afford a place that like well, i could spread out a little bit you know yeah and- no i mean that, that's i i have that conversation internally a lot because you know things are still nuts in san diego in terms of cost of living even out but, where you're at like you're kind of like a little more remote than you're not in the yeah city, yeah right? but it's still you know it's still essentially in the same realm uh real estate wise mm. and it's uh you know, I'm just, uh, I, I, my, my kid is here. So it's, it's, it's tough to make that step to move far away from them. Um, uh, so, you know, it's, it's, it's a choice you make. Right. And, and I, I still love it here. It, it's, uh, but it's, it's like, you think about just, you know, what you've discovered, the kind of place you could live for the same amount of money. Mm. Uh, it's a it's a conversation that you have to have and you you had it and, and you made that choice. <laughs> yeah man the quality of life just went so far i because i've been gone for 20 years too that was the interesting thing and without no planning i left here in the second the second week of may in 2000 went to seattle did my thing in there did a, a stint in the bay area and then it ended up in la and then ended up back here the second week of may 2020 mm-hmm. So you're like, a Chico dude. This is that's this is where you're from. Yeah, yeah. It's uh, I mean this area. Like Chico isn't technically my hometown. There's a smaller couple smaller towns that I guess I've lived in all the areas, so it kind of just feels like hometown. Yeah. And Chico's the coolest. Yeah. The rest of them are kind of dumpier, smaller towns. You're like, ah, I don't want to live there. Yeah. But um, yeah. Uh, just quality of life. Walking a lot. Having space for the dog. And um. And I get to teach yoga here still. I mean, we're things are kind of partially still closed down, right? But uh, but there's still classes happening at, with a bunch of precautions, and you know, like we're just doing the best we can to not yeah. go crazy like everybody else. Are you still you know A and Ring? Oh yeah, yeah, still doing Kiesel. Uh, everything's the same. Um, just working on more things all the time as as mm-hmm. things are available to work on. I mean, it's like it's people are. Uh, you know, it's, it's a tough, tough thing because it's not, there's not a big touring obviously, and there's not like a big demand. So it's a lot of studio work and, um, just kind of doing the, the, it's almost like everybody's every, anybody that was on Instagram or YouTube prior to this and like going hard, they're doing fine. You know, it's like, 
<laughs> they're like, hey, you, welcome everybody else. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> to the new, the you know what what the what the music business is now. Well, I mean, that's that was a lesson I had to learn. I I didn't have any kind of, you know, like I, now I've got a, a rig at home, but I didn't be before this year. I was I was uh -huh. you know, making my living on the road, so this was a, an adjustment that I had to make. Survival depended on it, right? So. It's yeah. uh, it's it's actually you know I'm real grateful that it's it seems to be working out. I'm really busy. I'm 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 working on stuff all the time. So, uh, you know, that, that it's what I I I figured. Oh, I'll get to work on my own music, right? I, I don't have time. I'm I'm working on other people's oh. projects all the time, um, which is you know that's 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 good and bad, right? So I, it, it's a good sure. problem to have because people are hiring me to do stuff. But uh, you know, I thought I'd have my next album finished by now, and I'm still, I'm still a, a good, a good ways away from it. <laughs> well, that was what I was going to ask. Is like maybe catch us up on what what you can tell us about what projects you're working on, and um... yeah, I didn't even know uh, how much is 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 the you know, open knowledge and how much isn't. But I'm like working on a couple of different things with with Devin right now, uh, which I think he's alluded to online that that he's got a, a couple of things in the works. So that's that. I don't think that's I won't get too specific, but I, I, <laughs> everybody knows he's working on stuff. Yeah. With, with other people's projects, I prefer to let them drive in terms of how much they they choose to reveal. But I'm 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 working on a thing. You know who Bear McCreary is? Mm -mm. He's uh, he writes a lot of of soundtrack music, a lot of scores. He did uh, Walking Dead and and uh, and uh, Battlestar Galactica and the, the movie Godzilla. You know the the more recent version of Godzilla. Uh, and I've done some soundtrack stuff uh, for him in the past, and now he's got another project going on that I can't be too specific about, but um, that's taking up a lot of time. And then uh, it, just uh, other artists that, that aren't like huge names but are doing really interesting work. Uh, there's a, a guy named Steve McAllister who's hired me and and uh, Dave Gregory from XTC to, to, to work on his record. and. And uh, this group that I'm uh, co-producing, really cool East Coast kind of modern you know, post-rock fusion trio called the Android Trio. Mm. Uh, so I'm doing some playing on their record and also co-production. And uh, uh, a couple of months ago, I was doing a lot of work for an, a, a songwriter named Pauly. He just goes by the name Pauly, P-A-W-L-I-E. Mm. Really good, good, melodic, thoughtful pop tunes. Just great, great songwriter, great singer. Um, and I played on nine tunes on his record, you know, a lot of overdubs, <laughs> keyboards and, and guitar and stuff. So there's just like a lot of, uh, you know, just every time I, I come to the end of one project, another one comes around the bend, you know, and, and when I grab a moment here and there, I, I try to work on my record, which is an interesting album with that's that's uh kind of brings together a lot of material from over the past 20 years and just like i've had mm. some back pocket stuff that hadn't found a home until now and then some much more recent stuff and uh i got steve by to play a thing on that and uh and uh david osman who's one of the the, the members of uh, a, a comedy uh group called the fire sign theater who were a, a huge huge thing for me they, they started in the late 60s um, kind of like the, the Beatles of comedy, the psychedelic uh, comedy for your head. They used to make uh, mm. studio records that were as intricate and interesting to listen to on headphones as a as a, a Beatles album or a Zappa album or something like that. They would just like you know drill down deep into this psychedelic audio, um, mm. spoken word, uh, and uh, and he's doing some stuff on my album and you know just uh brian beller's on there of course and and uh, sure. uh, uh nick di virgilio and uh mm. just a, a lot of really good players pete griffin on bass on on some Ooh, stuff and i love pete yeah he's wonderful um and then I, I'm, I'm also sort of weaving into it some some live material and and sort of jammier stuff uh it, it's it's kind of a, a collage of you know really arranged uh, studio material and then it, it floats in and out of some of this this really off the wall live stuff that that's more improvisational and crazy there's some crazy guitar playing on there so just you know as a as a player it kind of covers different realms of what i do from the more controlled studio environment stuff to just like going off on stage so it's 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 fun <laughs> that's awesome i mean it's it sounds like i mean you've you've made such a name for yourself uh in the the crazy guitar 
playing, you know, being able to do all this stuff for Zappa and Satriani and Vi and all that stuff. It's, it's cool to always see you go off on your own and do your own, you know, um, guitar acrobatics as well. Yeah. Well, it's a long time coming. I haven't done a, I haven't put out a solo album since, uh, 2016 and, and this one won't be out until next year. So that's, you know, it's a five year gap, which is sure. much, much, a much longer wait than, than I, I generally did, uh, have between my records, but I've, I've sort of just been, you know, busy working with other people and doing different projects, uh, between the Zappa hologram thing last year and then a bunch of work with Devin last year and then now which is continuing now and and uh so I, I was just sort of I was happy to like take a step back from my music and kind of let the ideas build up and 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 things get just get conceptually strong and now I have like a, a real clear vision of what I want this album to be and just no time to finish it. <laughs> but we'll get uh, there. It's, you know, as, as far as I can tell, uh, the, the, the longer it takes for me to, to get everything lined up, uh, it, I, it just, it gets stronger in my mind rather than, than weaker. And I, I'm like, at this point, I'm grateful for the, the time that it's taking to complete it because I just like, I know that by the time I actually bear down and get to focus have you know have that at the top of the of the the stack in terms of things to work on i'm going to be like on fire so i'm 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 really excited about that that's awesome it almost sounds like in a way that it, and i i feel like this is a, a a common theme at times is like when we want we set our, our sights on something we're like i'm going to do i'm going to do a new solo record then all these things are like first you got to do all these other projects and they pr provide some element of necessary tension in your life almost you know to the benefit of that project that you would love to get done but you know like this putting yeah. that space between you and the finish line is almost like a nice necessary welcome thing once you've adjusted to it yeah and it, and it's only going to make the final project stronger especially because i'm i'm not I, you know i haven't been a, a very even though I've, you know, done all these different projects, I work with all this different equipment and stuff. I'm not a, a tech oriented guy. I'm like, I'm really reliant on, on recording engineers and stuff. Mm. So I've, by necessity, I've had to, you know, make sense of all of this gear. Um, so in so many ways, I've, I've been talking with, with, with Devin about this a lot. This is a year of learning, right? Mm -hmm. um, and, and in, in so many ways, this, this experience of having to like get my act together technologically at home, um, and just like gradually build up different uh, strategies for just creating sound. Um, I'm just, I'm really just like taking baby steps in, in certain realms that other people have been really conversant in just, you know, like just manipulating MIDI data. Uh, mm. I've, I, it's, it's been completely uh, out of my, you know, just nowhere near my uh, realm of, of interest and or ability you know? and, and now i'm like into it you know i'm, I'm excited <laughs> by the the possibilities combining that kind of stuff with you know the 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 live playing and and finding that the balance that that feels right to me um and so uh, and now you know i've got all these these disparate chunks of of material from different eras and different groups of players and stuff and and weaving it all into you know one relatively coherent whole and it's going to be a pretty long album it's definitely going to be you know a double album length mm -hmm. uh, uh at least 90 minutes of stuff and and uh and uh, you know a lot of instrumental stuff but vo some vocal stuff as well and and figuring out ways to kind of encapsulate what this era is in lyrics which is really challenging uh because sometimes you know i find uh, plus i've just written so many songs over the years and, and finding something new to say lyrically but this year of all years there's so much to mm. say um but finding the right way to say it that doesn't feel cliched uh or you know just just you know like a a rerun of of the same stuff everybody else is saying because we're all feeling the same things in, in a lot of ways mm -hmm. um, but of course it's also there's there's never been a more polarized time uh certainly in this country it's 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 just amazing uh it's mind-blowing how you know, two people seemingly so much in, in common can have completely, completely different views of, of, of what's happening. Mm -hmm. 
and it it all it seems you know most of the the difficulties seem to stem from from just people not not finding that center you know and 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 being calm while you know obviously insane things are going on but the only way you can move effectively through it is is to is to be calm at your center and and uh and but finding a, a way to to make all of these thoughts and and impulses uh turn into a, a set of lyrics that that works as a song uh, rather than just uh you know, a, a, an explosion of, of the impulses is, is a challenge that I'm still like coming to terms with because, you know, you you try to find new ways to say something and you could easily end up not saying anything at all. So I'm, I'm, I'm finding that a challenge, mm. um, but I'm still like, I, I still believe in myself, Chris. I, I think somehow <laughs> I'll find a way through it. Yeah. I believe <laughs> I've, got in you lot, I've got a lot of, a lot of music in the works and, and, you know, in several places that are still waiting for lyrics and I'm like still, you know, hoping for, you know, a, a way to land on exactly what I want to say and the way I want to say it. Well, I actually, I love the insight to hear, to hear that from someone as, such as yourself that is, in a lot of ways, I think a lot of us think of Mike Keneally, all this you know, prolific writer, and you know, and all these things, and you've been, you've done so many big things, and not not everybody really realizes that that the creative process is just that, like every time, like, and uh, it's it doesn't necessarily even if when something comes together well, there's that that season of unsurety of how it's going to unfold or how it's going to come together in in like i actually have starting to learn to like it more and more because i'm starting to do some vocals on some of my projects that i have and and i so i can kind of identify that like i'm like oh i got the i got the basic broad concept and i've got the beginning and the middle and this stuff now how do i express this underlying concept and can i try not to use too many like common tropes can i can I really like, uh, can I be poetic about this or is that, you know, too forced and is that like too high minded? Yeah, I want to be too contrived. It is like, yes, the, the, contrived. Doesn't, doesn't this moment uh, demand something that, that that's a little more uh, genuine and, and authentic and deeply felt? Uh, uh, it's it, yeah, you, you run up against all this stuff and then, you know, mo compound that with having in my case, already done 30 albums or whatever with, with you know, a couple of hundred songs where, and so I'm trying not to repeat myself and, and simultaneously not repeat what other people are saying in the moment. And it's, it's, it's a very, it's a big, big challenge, you know, but, but it's, it's like, to, I really feel, I guess you'd have to call it a, a form of pressure, uh, I don't want to come out of the, you know, like someday in the hopefully not too distant future where we're all, where we're all vaccinated and able to just like <laughs> move around in the world again. Um, I don't want to feel like I've just gone back to where I was, you know, it, it, it feels like now's the moment to reinvent. Now, now's the moment to learn new ways. And, and mm. I, I do think that we're, we're headed toward a, you know, the, when we get back into the world again, it's going to feel very different from, from the way it was. It's not just going to be like, okay, we're, you know, we're, we're, we're picking up from where we left off. I think so much has changed and is continuing to change. It's such a, a crazy transitional time. Um, and all you, all, I guess all you can do really is, is, is trust that you will land in a, in a sensible place that to, and, and stay strong and stay focused and calm mm. and, uh, and ride with the changes, you know? I think that you mentioned earlier, like that part of the, the, the deal is to try to find that calm center, right? Like, and to, to ride the waves of all the uncertainty through this last year and all this. And I think it's been interesting to watch because as the tensions have arisen between family members and random people on Facebook or whatever, all this stuff, you see, you see it happen either both in your own life or, um, you know, kind of in adjacent to you that uh, a part of what this is exposed is that most people, I don't, or I'll, maybe not most, but a lot of people that thought they had their shit together and thought they had, you know, Oh, it's fine. Now they, they get squeezed and they realize that their process isn't necessarily bringing them peace, you know, like, and, and, and it exposes like uh, 
the things that we 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 fill up the day we're like oh we do all these things and like what are any of those things grounding you know are any of those right. things actually bringing you back and re resetting the clock you know a little bit yeah. so that you right. can then move because uh, we will go to excess and and really try to um kind of not deal with the things that maybe uh, we're taking us off center, but now it's like it. We're just so many people are left at home without a job, without, and they have so many things to do. But uh, you know, like for me, I, and I was, I, I kind of yoga and meditation is just like my answer, right? And a little bit of weed. So yoga, and then throw music in there, and then like That's I just the big three right there. <laughs> yeah, rinse and repeat. You know, it's the best <laughs> thing I can do. Um, and but I feel for those that out there that don't have that grounding thing i see that, that oftentimes those are folks that are the ones that are most vocal or and getting into trouble because they haven't found you know you can, the ground well you can certainly understand the frustration because it's 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 a it's a bit of a luxury to be able to to you know build that mm. kind of cocktail in your life to say okay I've, I've got yoga i've got meditation i've got weed i will i will you know use these three things in the proper proportion <laughs> to uh you know, achieve some kind of spiritual elevation and and certainly what you what you see online with with all this incredible uh, polarization and anger and uh, you know reactionary type of stuff and total uh, lack of uh, of empathy or or you know just the ability to understand where somebody else is coming from or even want to try to understand mm. it's coming from frustration because the, you know a lot of people yes indeed they're they're in situations they're stuck at home they're not working so that 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 this the, the the financial horror of that that so many people are going through right now um compounded with you know a, a lot of people who have not the the best family situation and yet are are in a situation where they're you know basically forced to uh to be face to face with with uh you know a a, a family member perhaps who's abusive or or you know sure. just angry uh there there are uh, these are the type of things that that understandably get in the way of 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 somebody just focusing on a spiritual life um so yeah there are huge, huge challenges. You uh, said it though. It is privileged. Like there, I'm. I am very privileged to have the space around. I mean, I'm a single person with a dog living in a three bedroom, two bathroom house now. Like I, I wake wake up every day. I'm like, oh my god, is it, this is still a thing that I get to do? You know, right, and it's. Right. It almost seems more fitting that I would have. You know, in some ways, like that that you stay in the smaller place with the cockroaches and you have more tension, so that you're in the trenches with everybody. But, uh, but, you know, yeah, you're right. Like there's so much uh, that is in the way and uh, it, it, it's not as easy, right? Like a lot of the teaching, the spiritual teachings and stuff. I was thinking about this the other day, like spiritual teachings and all that stuff is, is really for people of privilege more so than anything, because they can actually take the time to think about that. The, a lot of the poor, uh, less privileged people don't have that luxury of time to contemplate you know, and they're and they have so many triggers in their life between, you know, not having enough cash or not having this or not having uh, nurturing family and friends that are like, hey, man, I got you. I'll come over and I'll help you. You know, like you don't have a lot of that. And so um, it's 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 inevitable that the boiling point goes higher and higher. And there's uh, you you see people digging into their situation like look my frustrations come from here because i'm locked into this thing and and so they they clash heads with people that are in the opposite situation or right. you know mindset yeah it, 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 there's just um I, I don't and i don't think there's enough appreciation of the of everything that you just said you know uh that because it's so easy to see something online for instance that 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 you disagree with and then and then respond to it in in the, the in the most harsh and kind of abusive way and it and it just you know sets off a spiral because mm -hmm. that person that you're responding to they're not going to learn something from from you saying this they're just going to it's just going to spark their anger and it, and it just you know you end up with the the political situation that we've seen over the last four years it's 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 just horrific um so you know fingers crossed 
because there's no easy answers to this stuff but but we're obviously heading into a new zone and it's and it's intriguing and i i think uh indicative of 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 some uh you know real change that that everything is kind of coming down at once that you know the, the the vaccines are are you know starting to be slowly disseminated you know over the course of the next year it'll, it'll make its way around uh, hopefully the 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 people who are you know just like uh saying i'm never going to take that vaccine ca can somehow be be shown that it will Persuaded. benefit them and 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 everybody uh in their life if they do uh, and then it, it would appear that we're headed toward a, a more thoughtful and tolerant era uh, politically, um, and that the this idea of everything being so polarized and so uh, us versus them, uh, which you know, them or us is a is a Zappa album title, but, but <laughs> I'm not the sort of Zappa fan who thinks that everything he said was was 100% gospel. You know, I, I think. Sure it shouldn't always be opposition it shouldn't always be versus it yeah, that the, the our only hope i think as a species is, is to come together and accept one another's differences and and find a way through and more importantly you know understand that it, it shouldn't matter to you what what somebody else does for to achieve their own happiness and satisfaction in their life it's it's literally none of your business um and that's what is so confusing to me is 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 why people get so worked up by someone else's choices you know as as, yeah. as long as their choices aren't directly impacting your you know health and happiness then what's the deal um so i'm you know i th i think that w what we've seen in in the last 4 years is everyone's uh, demons uh you know just like being encouraged mm. to 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 rise to the, the the top of 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 their consciousness and and be you know just like Rah! and <laughs> and and it, it's good to know what you're dealing with you know it's it's I, I think it's it's good to know how your neighbors are feeling about things uh, i think a lot of people's eyes have been opened mm -hmm, um mm -hmm. And and the thing now it would seem to me is is not to not to continue battling through it, but but to you know find your own road to peace within it. Maybe you know I honestly feel like what just what we've just gone through uh, as as a as a, you know I'm speaking of the United States here um, is probably something that needed to happen in 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 some ways because mm -hmm. there there's a, a lot of complacency that can settle in and my hope anyway uh and even though i'm, I'm a, a little a little skeptical because uh, you know when when everything gets back to normal whatever that is uh, of course a lot of people are just going to fall into the the same you know mindset and, and modes of behavior that they had before but um i'm also hopeful that there will be enough genuine evolution and enough thoughtfulness and uh, enough people who have learned something through all of this to mm. uh to maybe you know kick the evolutionary cycle you know in the butt a little bit maybe maybe we'll get a little bit closer to some sort of you know the 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 spiritual level that i think is the reason we're alive you know i i, mm. I think we're we're all supposed to be heading towards some sort of unified bliss state um, <laughs> And uh, I, I'd, I'd be real shocked if it comes in my lifetime. But you know, I, I think it's our job as a as a as a as a people, as a species, to continue trying to roll that that ball forward. So we'll yeah, see. I think I think you're right in the sense that, especially that what has happened with uh, with this administration the last four years has been a strange medicine. In that, had it been. Uh, status quo of how we rolled over to a Hillary administration or something like that. So much of this, so much, so many things wouldn't have come to light. All the loopholes that have been, uh, you know, uh, just, you know, like that this administration has been very obvious about like, Oh, we're just going to do whatever we want and here and here and here. And, and, and so it's really brought it to the forefront. We're like, Oh, like they're, Wow, we should maybe we, maybe we we need to really like clap back on some of our our uh, governmental you know people our representatives because if this guy can do this 
it only takes somebody dumber than that, you know, or more audacious, audacious or, you know, and, and, and um, narcissistic to, to really cause a whole lot more catastrophe. Right. And yeah. Uh, and, and, of, and of course the, the, honestly, the, the most troubling aspect of all of it is, is, you know, it's, you, it's still, you, you can't feel too victorious, uh, you know, mm -hmm. uh, when you see how many people are still very happy to just believe something because, somebody they consider to be charismatic tells them that it's true people right. are so very you know like hungry to swallow lies you know um and, and it's because it's 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 comforting you know it's it 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 it, uh, it supports their belief system and it's it's just like daddy says it's true so it must be true and it's it's very unhealthy <laughs> i see it on the left too man that's been the, oh, of course maybe been the most eye awakening for me this year is like it's not that i didn't i mean i kind of knew that this underbelly of the right was there we saw it in the tea party a little bit we saw it in a few things there was there was premonitions to this but the subtler more passive aggressive act, act acts of the left that kind of like continue to um multiply the way that they're they in turning being part of the cancel culture and be like oh you said one thing wrong you're done like everybody's like done with you and it's and it's done in the name of you know like this righteousness and it's and in a way that um isn't it's it's a different kind of uh object objectification in a way like it's saying you know oh you, you know you're just entertainment to us you know whatever you are your 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 tv show your music or whatever and there's no room for error here you know there's no room for humanity to be in involved in your human life which is a strange thing to clap down on you know and yeah, um it it, it 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 seems that there's not uh there's not much uh wiggle room given for you know people's learning processes because it is impossible for somebody to say something uh hurtful and unevolved uh and and then come to see that that's wrong change their behavior and then you know still be you know battered about the head and shoulders with it a, a couple of decades later because they they mm -hmm. slipped up um, so that, yeah, that, that can be disappointing, uh, when, you know, people who are supposedly, you know, flying the flag for a more tolerant approach, a more accepting, uh, you know, a more inclusive approach are so, you know, there, you, you can sense like the, the, there's a gleefulness, uh, yeah. to, uh in cutting somebody down to size. Oof. And, and unfortunately I, I think that that's, you know, people get conditioned, uh, because that's that's the the energy they're receiving, you know. It, it, it's like at that right at the beginning of of the the Trump administration, there was, you know, the, uh, people just like the, the, so gleeful about you know, oh, your liberal tears are so delicious and all that <laughs> that kind of stuff. So you know, people uh, you know, and just like I haven't seen the word snowflake in a long time, but that that word was was really being you know wielded with with a lot of uh, a lot of vigor. You know, just just the, this sort of bullying essentially, right. and, it's, and it's real similar to high school, you know, um, and and I and I think that you know, the, the, the victims of that bullying over the course of, of the last four years got, you know, they got tired of it and they started wanting to turn the tables and, and then, you know, so, in the, but they weren't just, you know, training their, their sights on, on the, the political opponents. It was also on, on anyone who, uh, had, you know, had slipped up and maybe, you know, in, in some cases, yes, some of the, 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 the people who got canceled deserved to be canceled because totally. it was, it was absolutely indicative of, of abusive uh, mindsets and patterns of behavior and a, a lot of sexism and, and, you know, like borderline and sometimes not even borderline rapey type behavior. And, and, and that stuff yeah. needs to be called out. Um, 100%. Yeah. I'm super. Yeah, I, I agree with you. It's it. I think it's the the pendulum swings back and forth, right? And it, and it each time it passes center and goes a little too far to like find the balance point. That's the kind of the nature of the thing. Yeah. But I've heard it explained like as a as a circle, right? Like like you have left and you have right. But if the left goes too far, it becomes right. If the right becomes too <laughs> goes too far, it becomes left. And there's well, there's elements. Sense. Uh, you know, in terms of you know, physics and geometry, that definitely makes sense, doesn't yeah. it? Yeah, <laughs> and it's like when, when and they like I, I don't know, know who said it, but it was uh, 
It's it's when when the leftist, especially, and this is the thing, because because I identify left and liberally, and you know, and hippie and flowers, but I have uh, some con- conservative qualities about me too. I think it's fine to own guns. I think you should know how to use them. I think it's not a horrible thing, right? Like I think you can, and I think you can like really respect police officers while asking for some reform too. I think, you know, I think I think it's just it's the black and white thing. Um, the polar- polarization part is weird um so it, it it's a no i mean i mean that that is it's just like it, it's so clear that that change is needed and and so you can want all of the change at once and <laughs> and, and and do your your own side a, a good bit of harm in 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 like being too uh intractable about that you know yeah, it, it, and hasty it, it, and in, yeah. your, in the big moving sweeping changes because but, at the, but then at the same time we speak from a, pl- a place of privilege right we can walk sure. out on the street just being who we are and 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 not have to worry so much about somebody you know shooting us for eating a sandwich you know it, 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 oh it, you got it that's <laughs> i mean that, and, and again that's thank you for continuing to bring that to the conversation because it's something that uh I, you know, I'm always having to, I've had, I'm thankful. I have, I, I'm in a great group of friends and circle that like, as I spout out a thing, somebody's like, okay, cool. White guy, you know, in America. And like, you know, you sure that makes like, that's a reasonable statement for you to make because that's your experience, yeah. you know, and it's not everybody's experience, man. And you gotta like, and so that, and that, and that's the, it's a crisis of perception. You know, and 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 point of view, right? Because like I, it's hard. We can you and I can only imagine what it's like to live in a brown body that has, you know, been subjected to inordinate amounts of like like lack of trust just by seeing them on the street, and yep. and so you got to imagine how that sits in the body over time, you know, and where that goes, and then uh, and so so everybody gets trained into these 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 grooves and these ruts and that's like i think that's where where education really comes to the forefront right like we can get out of ignorance through uh, a reasonable amount of uh education and and i think it's why we need lots of it and you know and have it be affordable and accessible for all bodies and yeah uh especially yeah people need access to 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 information as as expressed by different sorts of voices as opposed to just you know hearing the same sort of thing from the same sort of person mm. all the time it, mm. it's it's i mean i i i grew up in a very middle class you know white background and and was exposed to all sorts of uh, intolerance and uh, and it's it's easy it's almost addictive to to buy into that stuff um because it it's 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 easy and addictive and and comforting to to have your your prejudices supported all the time mm. and it's it's that's way easier than than breaking out of your your uh your mode of behavior and thinking and and gaining a wider view you know it's like i it really i didn't start to to have my perspective widened until I started traveling. Um, and a lot of people never leave their, their hometown, you know? And, and so their entire worldview is, is starts with what their parents tell them, you know, and, and then is, it continues to be colored by what the, the, the people in their, uh, in their neighborhood, uh, believe and say, and it's just an echo chamber of the same stuff over and over and over again. And, you know, just a lot of suspicion and intolerance. And, and then, you know, if, if, if somebody from another culture does come into that uh, beehive uh, and they're confronted with all this aggro energy and stuff, it probably doesn't bring out the best in them. And then there, there's, there's going to be, you know, some sort of conflict, which then uh, solidifies the, the original prejudice of the, of the inhabitants of the town. And, and it just, you know, just it turns into just ugliness and, and uh the the only hope really is is for people to have their 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 view uh widened you know their horizons expanded mm. uh through education and 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 just like become peaceful with the idea that you don't know everything <laughs> 
you know, just because you believe something doesn't mm -hmm. mean it's true. And, and, uh, and it, it, it's, it's funny how so many of these people profess to be uh, Christians oh my and, God. Uh, and, <laughs> you know, there's a whole other topic, right? Yeah. Um, and, and how, you know, you know, if it, honestly, I, that I, I'm, you know, I'm not, a, I'm not, a, I don't identify as Christian, but I will ask myself, what would Jesus do mm -hmm. a lot, mm -hmm. you know, be, because I think that's actually a pretty good barometer, you know, I, sure. I, I have a, a lot of respect for, for, you know, you, you have to be somewhat skeptical about the accounts of what he said and did. But, you know, at least the, the picture that I've filled in seems like a you know, pretty righteous dude. And, 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 uh, and at, at least what he represents to me uh, is, is a filter that I can employ pretty effectively, you know, because it just means uh, being thoughtful, uh, being accepting, and, uh, and being peaceful, you know. Uh, Oh. Yeah, imagine that. Imagine, well, that's the thing. Imagine if all the Christians or identifying Christians had a process or a practice in their life that that oriented them towards peace, right? But much of modern Christianity, uh, the way they, the way that they, I was born and raised Christian. So, like, I'm very familiar. My mom and my family is still mostly on that side of the fence, you know? Uh, they, um, but, but I, but the way I was raised and like taught to pray essentially was kind of making demands on God. Like, will you please <laughs> like, I like your plan. I know you got a plan and the Bible told me that and all that, but like uh, my plan is pretty interesting. I would like you all seeing come down here and like, let me get that job or let me get a raise or let me my football team win or like you know and it's so there it's very self-centered right and it's not that's like that was the practice that i was kind of left with and i was like this is empty and mm -hmm. but if but if everybody you know if peace was the goal if that really was, if we put that at the center it, christian or non-christian if we put that towards the center of our lives and say you know what what if I were to set my life up or to arrange the way I thought and my efforts towards creating peace in the world, in my personal life and the micro and the macrocosm, how, how would that shift things and maybe make a, a list, you know, like orient, if we just were to orient even a degree towards peace, just everybody had one little degree or a little micro shift, mm -hmm. then, then there would be more, you know, hands across the aisle politically. There would be more, you know, uh, hey, neighbor, let me help you. Like, because uh, I, I don't want this to be weird in the neighborhood. Let me just, I'll come help your project or I'll, I'll do the thing that takes the ease, uh, you know, makes your situation more easeful. And uh, being, be, being more willing and oriented towards being the one that, uh, that kind of closes the gap. I think is kind of yeah. the interesting thing, you know, because yeah. so many people are got heels dug in. Oh, it's not my responsibility. Your fucking problem, friend, you know, mm -hmm. and it's like, mm -hmm. uh, well, that's not very Christian. <laughs> I mean, no. I think we're supposed to like they need food. Let's go. Let's go feed them, you know, or whatever the case is, you <laughs> yeah, know, like, exactly. Yeah. Yeah. No, that's all true. I'm glad we're having this conversation. I think it's it's actually <laughs> uh, maybe, uh, you know, uh, good. crack a couple of things for me in the in the lyric writing department. So mm. this is Ooh, good. <laughs> what? <laughs> all right all right just put my name in the liner notes it's fine. <laughs> you gotta, yeah, i'll give you a thing <laughs> no, that's kidding um well i wanted to ask you uh of course you know it's a pick podcast also like uh and i like to talk about guitar picks and stuff and yeah you still playing the 420 is that the deal i love it i love it I yeah really love it, man. I mean, well i'm curious about <laughs> like uh i want to make kind of two questions with you um because uh i want to i'd like to know about what you remember your early years of playing and what guitar what do you remember about guitar picks in the early days do you remember what, what color or what kind it was and then yeah, i mean I, I think they were all pretty you know sort of like fender medium based you know it, it, it's it and uh, you know I, I i definitely remember one that i probably still have in a in a, in a glass over there that that mm. you know basically that, that dimension that thickness but had this multicolored sort of modeled uh look to it um 
uh, I, I, I think, yeah, for, for, and I didn't really, I never really investigated it. I never thought about it. I, I, it was just about, it was probably what was in the music store, you know, just, just whatever. I, and the medium felt okay to me. Sure. Um, and I, and I, I never had guitar lessons, so I was, I was never that uh, thoughtful mm. and, 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 and it, it's really just like in the last relatively few years that I've really started to, to take a look at, uh, and, and be really more drilled down and focused on, on the, the tonal and, and, and home recording is really good for this because, you know, you're, <laughs> you're just like, you're in, you're in close proximity to the, to the tone that you're producing. And, and, mm. and that's when you really realize, so if I just do that, you know, just, just like turn that, that much more or less perpendicular to the string, the, the, the infinite variety of, of tonal variation there. Um, it's, 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 it's endless. It's endless. And I still haven't like, there's like, there's no one way I hold the pick. There's no one thing that I do. I'm constantly adjusting depending on the part, depending on, mm. on how I'm, you know, the, the, because you, you know, if you, if you want to do a feathery strum, you hold it one way, but if you want to do a type thing and you've got to deal with it in different ways. And, and it's like, I still am like, I will always for the rest of my life be focused on, on, trying to figure because it's i still move my whole arm too much when i play mm. because i just i didn't from an early age start working on this is also just a, a function of of how much things change over the course of generations you know it's, it was one thing to be a guitar player in the 70s with limited access to being able to you know, the, and the music was different then. Uh, th there wasn't endless, you know, millions of hours of, of of video available to to like study and see how other guys play. Mm. Um, you know, you were you were pretty much limited to whatever your guitar teacher told you. And I never had a guitar teacher, so it was just about just you know, I'm hit, I'm hitting the strings with the pick. I'm <laughs> I'm producing a sound. That's that's all I know. And then as I started learning more and more intricate material and like cra crazy Zappa melodies and stuff and faster things and stranger string leaps and whatnot, interval shifts, um, it was always just do whatever I can to, 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 to make it happen. And then, it, you know, once, once I like had learned how to play the black page on the guitar reasonably well, I, I like considered my, my job done. It's like, okay, now I can play the black page, but fast forward 10 years and i and i realized oh wait a second if i just do this a little more economy a little less frenetic motion i i can execute this phrase so much so much more accurately you know there's like mm. a slop from from string to string and then at the same time figuring out oh with these crazy melodies that frank wrote um there's a lot of different ways you could finger them on on, on the fretboard and you know figuring out ways to like uh uh incorporate uh pull offs to open strings in the middle of a of a of a line all of a sudden a, a line that seemed incredibly awkward and, and I was never able to execute it cleanly. If in the middle of it I just go boop, just like a pull off from say an F to a an open B, uh that just is like a little breath of air in the middle of the thing and and, and allows me to execute the following phrase that much more smoothly and and it just all of a sudden there's this uh, more undulating flow to the thing. It doesn't feel so, so cooped up and, and awkward. Mm. And, and, uh, you know, and so the picking technique is, is it's an endless thing. You know, it, it, you can, can, you can just focus on it. I, but I, I like, I remember when I was, uh, in Vi's band on one of the G3 tours and, and John Petrucci was, was the opening act. And I was just like, fascinated with his ability to like do this insane stuff without hardly moving his hand at all mm -hmm. you know? like, how are you doing that Ugh. and and you know and just like sitting with him and trying to glean some of it you know and it's basically just like an incredible amount of focus and strength uh and just like i haven't developed these muscles the way he has but he can just go mm -hmm. with you know barely moving and that's you know who has time <laughs> you know, when, know. when there's so much other work to be done. But but I, even just like knowing that that's a goal, as opposed to you know just like just uh, here's a fast part. I just move my whole arm as fast as I can. You know that's not that's not um, efficient. 
uh, because if you can drill down that motion to the, the smallest possible component of your you know, muscular structure, then you're going to get a lot more efficiency and accuracy. So it's, uh, you know, I, I have so far to go, but I, I feel like I've become a, a bit more uh, focused on it. And playing with Devin, it was like, it was really helpful with that because it's so much of the stuff, like I saw somebody online the other day, they were watching the, the, the live video that, that just came out, uh, mm -hmm. Order of Magnitude from the, which is like exactly a year ago, the gig that we did at the Roundhouse in London. Um, and they were like, I, I, I can't hear Keneally in the mix. And it's like, yes, you can actually, because we're playing the same thing so much of the time. Devin's on, I think Dev's on the left and I'm on the right. That's like, it was a big, uh, it was important to him that mm. we be phrasing the same thing at the same time. A lot of the time, that's 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 part of the sound that he wanted to, to put out there. And when you listen to it, it sounds really strong. This, this, you know, the idea of two guys phrasing this stuff in precise unison it's a different feel than if it's just one guy splitting his signal and, and, you know, and, and you get like a, a, an artificial doubling. It's not the same thing as two guys playing it with their own humanity coming into play and slightly different tones and whatnot. Mm. Um, I had the same experience. I, I got to play with Devin live in London in 2011. And uh, I mean, I was literally sweating bullets like, like to try, cause like I'm just try, trying to stay, I mean, I practiced a lot, you know, before we obviously I wasn't going to show up there without being practiced, but but just being in the being in time and in lock and step with him on a bunch of these little like very delicate acoustic things. And it was kind of a similar thing left and right. And I'm just like and, and there's a point for me, at least in that unison happening where you can kind of disappear. Right. Like yeah, it's like yeah. you're like, am I still playing is, you know, like I, I like I would have these little moments of like airless or weightless kind of because you don't know there's nothing to contrast with your right. especially especially when you're using you know in-ears and stuff but well i see i i so i was so desperately anti-in-ears for such a long time mm. and like I remember on a Death Clock tour uh, where uh, Brendan was already on in ears. Gene was obviously on in ears because he, you know, the, our, the entire Death Clock show was being played to a, a click because everything we were playing had a visual component with the cartoons up on the on sure. the LED screen. So we had to be, you know, obviously uh, on a grid. So, but all I was doing was playing along with Gene. Gene had the the hard job. He had to play with the click. All I had to do was play along with the drummer, and I was fine. Uh, and so the and 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 meanwhile, I had you know just like I had earplugs in, and and my my wedge was just ragingly loud on stage. And <laughs> so the the John Winter, the the front of house guy, was just like trying to control the amount of volume on stage, and and of course, not having wedges on stage is a great way to do that. So he's like, please, Mike, please, you know, try in here. So, so this would be like probably 2009. Uh, and, and so in ear technology has come a long way since then. And, and, uh, so they, they set me up with some in ears at, at soundcheck. And I, you know, I heard how you could, you place everything just so, and, and, and like, they say, yeah, we know that you know. There's the the thing that all, everybody always says about feeling cut off from the energy of the room, but we can we can feed in audience mics, so you can still feel and hear the the, the room and, and stuff. Yeah. And, and so, you know, and I we played a song with the in ears, and it was like listening to a record, which is the other thing that everybody always says. But I still felt like strangely disconnected from the experience, and so. Mm at the end of it and they're all waiting to hear what I have to say. And, and my response was, it sounds beautiful and I hate it. <laughs> <laughs> and so they said, okay. And I, you know, and I continued playing with wedges, but last year when we did the bizarre world of Frank Zappa, I had no choice because we were playing along with recordings of Frank mm. and, and, and we, and, and if you want to control the sound on say on stage, I couldn't just have Frank's audio screaming at me from the, from my wedge uh or the click you know everybody was playing along with the click it was absolutely required mm -hmm. um so it, it i finally said okay i have to i have no choice and the, and in, and at that point i became an absolute acolyte i said and, and started proselytizing on behalf of in ears because i could get <laughs> i could get the 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 mix just exactly right i was splitting my signal i was playing through a ksr and of and the fractal at the same time, so I had the, the KSR on my left, I had the fractal on my right. I was controlling the, each signal with volume pedals, so I could, I could, you know, feed in just the whatever amount that I wanted, so 
I was I was crafting my tone ex exactly the way I wanted from night to night, and I just got very excited about it. And then the next the next live experience was with Devin, and at that point I had Devin hard left and me hard right, and and I was like obviously focusing on phrasing very precisely along with him. And I couldn't have done it without the in ears. It was absolutely a, a, a requirement. And in, and I learned so much on that tour about about picking technique, because I realized okay, so the, the same thing where it's like I, I I can you can feel like you're getting lost if mm -hmm. you're playing precisely in unison with somebody else. That's that was mitigated somewhat by the fact that I had a split hard left and right. Uh, and then as as I could get into you know just moving the positioning of my pick in relation to the string it it affected my tone so much and and mm. all of a sudden the you know it's like if i if i did this it, it sounded like you know a bunch of clarinets suddenly were playing along with us if i did that too here come the oboes you know it's like all okay. these different little uh equalization techniques you know it just it's you you realize yes the tone really is in your fingers it, it's it's and, and and to an extent that i never even uh like tripped out on as as much before but in and that tour exactly one year ago was, was where I, I i suddenly came to realize just how much just how much effect on your tone uh t picking technique has and you know the amount of, of pressure that you apply and uh in the thickness of the pick and, and all that. And yeah, I definitely got some people, uh, you know, excited about these picks last year. You know, it's like, it, 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 cause I showed them to people and, and they, you know, you know, obviously you know how big these things are. Um, and, and people were stunned that I was playing with them. I used to play, you know, be, because a couple, not too long ago, I was playing the little red jazz picks, you know? Right. Uh, and, and they're, they're great too. They're, they're all great. And sometimes I think you have to change up your pick thing just, just to, to see what else is possible because you, you can get so complacent in a way, just, just sitting in your, in your groove. Um, but man, I'm still loving this. And, and, and a lot, a lot of people that I turned on to it, they were just like for in, in one moment feeling like I couldn't possibly play with that to just feeling like, I'm I'm happier than I've ever been. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I love. That's one of my favorite things about handing those picks out. Is <laughs> and I and I happened that day at Kiesel with you, and I'm like, I know, I know, it's crazy. Here you go, check it out, Mike. And you're like, what? Oh, wait, can I have a couple more of these? Uh, yeah. You know, and it, just seeing seeing that shift and 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 it takes you know some of the thicker picks you know aren't as playable and i this one just kind of it was a perfect storm it came out in a way that it's like it's i think the bevel just it, that's not, it it's it it's like yeah. that's it that's the thing and it's uh had, had it not if you don't get the right beveling or the right tip and all that stuff then like a thick pick isn't necessarily going to give you the same experience yeah. right it just flat out won't and 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 every other prior experience i'd had with the thick pick was was that feeling mm. um, and and I and I wouldn't have thought that that it would be the right kind of pick for playing the the kind of music I was playing with Dev, and but it turned out that it was exactly the right kind, you know. And and then the 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 fact that it is it's it's such a a weighty tool to, mm -hmm. to wield, uh, and and then as I was you know doing these experiments during the gig, you know, as I was listening to the effect it was having on my tone because because and it was you know impacted by the fact that i was so often playing exactly the same thing that devin was playing and it was the combination of both of our tones that when i would make mm. these tiny adjustments and then you know i would finally settle in and find that's the that's it that's at least this part in this song at this moment that's what's delivering like the maximum amount of of power mm. in this in this particular riff while devin and i are playing this this thing together and, and and sometimes it would be like some position that I'd never played in before, and I would have to adjust the the rest of my wrist and arm in order to accommodate it. But that was like producing the sound that felt like the song needed more than anything. It gave you just enough separation to hear yourself and to like sit in the mix correctly. That whole yeah. I mean, I'm impressed that you are, I mean, maybe, do you think it's because you didn't really take guitar lessons that you're so malleable and, and, and like open to all things, you know, I like shifting? So. As... So because, you know, all my, all my music lessons as, as a kid were on keys mm -hmm. and, you know, and when I finally got a guitar, it was just about 
translating some some of the information from my from my keyboard lessons over to the guitar but most of my you know guitar education was from listening to records uh, and learning stuff off of records like the the summer of my of when i was 16 years old where i i i spent all my time learning every gentle giant guitar part or you mm. know teaching myself zappa stuff as i became more and more uh, enamored of, of frank's music um so it was always about learning songs and learning parts, but not about producing tone. Uh, and, and it didn't become about producing tone until like years into, into my career. And, and, and then that, that whole mindset got a big kick when I went to in ears. And then, you know, I'm just, just a year ago. I mean, I've been, I've been playing guitar for as you know, last year, I was, uh, so it was 40, 46 years I've been playing guitar at wow. that point. And, and, and it was that experience of, of playing in unison with Devin with the in-ears then that I really started to just become uh, a student in uh, of the the sound changes uh that were only coming as a result of of changing the positioning of my pick on the string mm. and and i don't think i'm set in my ways at all because i will i will change it in, in a heartbeat if i think that's what the song needs and that's and that's also a matter of of, of being a producer because you know I'm, I'm i'm in producer head at the same time that i'm in performer head and and you can be even more in producer head with the in ears because it really does sound like a record if you've got you know if you take the time at soundcheck to to and and of course now nowadays since everything's programmed you mm. you basically you 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 get everything dialed in at, at rehearsal before the tour starts and and then hopefully with only minor changes from from gig to gig to accommodate you know whatever the the, the weird uh, acoustic anomalies might be at that gig which even though everything is going direct uh, because very, very, you know, we weren't the only thing that were the only things that were actually moving air molecules on stage on the Devon tour were drums and vocals. Everything else was mm. direct. both Devin and I were only using fractal. Uh, you yeah, know, all the, the, the keyboards and bass are, are direct. And, and, and so, it, and, you know, in any, any samples or anything like like that we weren't playing with a click we weren't playing with tracks which was a new thing for devin but but uh, diego the the our keyboardist uh, who's also the keyboardist in haken which was opening for us yeah um he had in his keyboard arsenal sampled uh things from the the empath multi-tracks so you know like there's certain sounds in a song like borderlands or evermore or something that you you can't just like uh replicate on stage through through normal wielding of instruments it's a, it's an, an insane combination of textures that is uh essential to the song at that moment so that would be like something that was sampled from the multi-track but still triggered in real time right by Diego as a as a part mm -hmm. of his performance so it, that's still like uh you know that, that that still passes the test and the purity test because Devin had said <laughs> before that tour that we weren't going to play the tracks and we didn't then when we played in the in the u.s uh in the spring of this year the tour that was you know foreshortened in the middle of it because we had to fly home in the middle of march um he had to take a smaller band out and unfortunately wasn't able to take out all the the vocalists that we had in in europe last year at that point we had to, to have choirs on tracks for like four of the songs so mm. for the for the the two weeks that we played in the states uh this year we we were playing to a, a very limited amount of tracks but for Devin, it was still a very real human uh approach to, to playing live much, much more than had been his his standard mo right. uh, yeah he'd been dependent on the, the click and the tracks for ever basically mm -hmm. to make sure that it's ocd you know like it's got to come out right you want to know that everybody's in the right place and yeah the whole and, deal you know, and certainly there's there will that'll always be a major part of him and and it's a, a part of what makes his music so glorious the fact that he he controls mm -hmm. so so carefully and makes it you know everything be just so that's why it has the impact that it has but he also came to love the the uh the the, the human aspect uh the energy that's that's produced from a more spontaneous uh interaction on stage and mm. uh anyway and he was worried about how it was going to go over and and it, it went over amazingly you know this is just the response from audiences it was such a loving 
feeling at those shows and the, and the, the response to the, to, uh, order of magnitude, the, the live release that, that just came out has, has been wonderful. It's, you mm. know, it's, it's clear, you know, there will always be people who are just like, you know, fuck that. I would just want to listen to something. <laughs> uh, but, sure. but, but, you know, I, I think that people, he's, he's so open, you know, he shares all of himself right. and, uh, and, and people feel that. And that's inspiring to me because I'm secretive by nature, you know, and, and it's one of the things that makes it hard, hard for me to write lyrics. And mm. I'm, I'm trying to, uh, I'm, I'm, there's a certain, there's a, a, a number of things that I'm trying to get past. You know, I'm trying to unblock in that way, mm. uh, you know, cause a lot of my lyrics in the past, they've just been really surreal, uh, or, or, you know, at, at one point in, in the early two thousands, I did a couple albums, uh, wouldn't smoke and dog where I just started making up words, you know, just, just mm. like, it, it, it was, that was the only way to like get out what I was feeling was, was to just invent a language. Um, and it, wow. it, it was, uh, it was successful in some ways and it did express a feeling, but it was, it's not a feeling that you can explain or, 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 or you can share it only in that here's, here's the song and I'll play this song for you. I will share this song with you, but, but it's, it, it's, I was trying to relate on a, on a more cosmic level, but I, 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 and I think I was successful to some degree, but I would like to be, able, I would like to be relatable on a more human level as well. So I have, I'm still in the midst of that process. Well, good for you for, for, for always like evolving. That's the thing. I think it's been interesting because you, when, when somebody like yourself, uh, and I, I, I have to say that it's interesting lineage, right? Because Zappa was so prolific and put out so many things and took all these interesting little risks, whether he saw them as risks or not, uh, you know, and then influenced uh, people like Vi and Elf, Devin, and in some some aspect, you know, uh, either even if it wasn't a direct influence, I can see the little seedling things in each one of your guys' work where you're like, Oh, like it's like Zappa, like just touched you, you know, a little bit. Well, yeah. Well, it's interesting talking to Devin about Zappa because he, he, uh, you know, he's, he's a great appreciator of, of what Frank was up to, but, but couldn't relate to on, on, totally. on a lot of levels. And, and, and I, and I think it really came down to the cynicism aspect that, that he, he just found very off putting cold. Um, yeah. But, yeah. But, but he, you know, he certainly can relate to the, uh, the desire to, to have control. <laughs> right. Um, but it, it, but it's what's interesting about Frank is just uh, is just how how much control he was he was happy and actually uh, he relied on being able to relinquish a, a, a lot of that control on stage uh, because he wanted there to be every night he wanted there to be completely improvised occurrence. Mm. He wanted to have a group of musicians that he could, you know, rely on to bring something, you know, fresh and, and new. And it was that balance between the completely controlled, composed, rehearsed, precise stuff, and then moments where anything could happen. And you know, and he was he was conducting those improvisations, but it, not constantly. Like he would, he, it was just like you know, kicking a, a boulder down the hill. You know, like he mm. would set something in motion. And then he would, he could just you know stand there and watch it happen. You know, it, 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 was, it was a beautiful thing, you know, as a fan, as much as I was a band member, it was a beautiful thing to be a part of. Have you seen the movie? Have you seen the, the documentary? That I haven't seen about? it yet. No, I want to watch that. Yeah, I think you'll, you'll enjoy it. I was, I was self-conscious watching it because I'm in it much more than I was expecting to be. Uh, oh. Alex, Alex Winter, who, who directed it, uh, conducted interviews with, with a, a number of us during the rehearsals for the, the hologram tour. Hmm. Uh, so we went over to this this uh, little area that he had set up to conduct the interviews, and we talked for like three hours or something. And he was like, "Man, thanks for the interview. I think I, I got a lot of stuff that that I can use." And and you uh, you suspect at that point that you might get like you know fifteen twenty seconds in the thing, but he returned to me often, and that was uh, I'm I'm self conscious about seeing myself, so it it, it was it was weird. <laughs> Uh, the first time I watched it, but then the second time I watched it, I got past that and and just like really enjoyed the the picture that he painted of Frank as a as a human and as a composer, mm. and and not so much as a rock star. Uh, that was his focus, uh, and and he uh, he did a really really fine job. You know, the the one complaint that most people have about it is just that you can't get it all in in two hours. You know, it's it's, it's you know. Uh, 
by necessity it's a, a very circumscribed view but it's it's uh it's i've never seen another another study of frank that is as emotionally affecting as, mm. as, as uh, i think you should, you should check it out. I think I'm, I'm looking forward to it. That, it just by your uh, recommendation alone. I knew it had come out, but I hadn't got around to it yet. Um, I was gonna. Well, what I was gonna ask you too is, uh, do you remember in your time with Frank? Do you a, a do you remember what he was using as a guitar pick at that time, or in, in he that... had these these metal, uh, yeah, these these like stainless steel. Oh, really? Yeah. And okay. I, I I I have I had one of them. I I wonder if I still do. But like if you listen to his tone on a lot of those 1988 recordings, uh, it, he's he's because his his strat was so juiced up and, and modified with preamps, it, it just direct that thing had a, a, a hip, an unbelievably hellacious clean tone. Mm. It just, like it would, it would just you know most most guitars when you plug them in direct they 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 just kind of sit there. But this mm -hmm. thing just would spit, you know. It was, it, 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 if you listen wow. to a lot of the, the clean tones and hear the combination of the steel pick on on a clean strat going direct, uh, it, there's it, it's a it's a very very human sound. It's a very it's it's like boy, that's Frank, man. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you just you're hearing nothing but Frank. It's so really this is a steel cool. pick that was in a, like, like a traditional shape of a pick, or yeah, was it like shaped like a like a like a Fender medium, you know? Okay. <laughs> Cool. Yeah. Yeah. That's interesting. I, I, th I guess I had read that maybe somewhere, but I wasn't really sure what his relationship was to pick. And I never really, I don't know, looked through it, looked for it too hard, I guess. But yeah. And, uh, and I like, I, I wouldn't know ex precisely when he started using it. I, I think he might have been using it in the prior tour, which was 84. Uh, but I don't know how, uh, you know, uh, at what point he adopted it. I'm, I'm really not the guy to ask about gear i'm so not it's gear okay <laughs> well i'll ask you a different question um what do you think what what do you think the things that you what, what did you learn from the what were the most important things you learned from working with frank you know what what, what did you glean from that experience i i there was there was there were many difficulties on that tour there were like interpersonal difficulties and in, in, in certain members of the band and 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 frank was ill at the time so he couldn't really you know wield the 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 tyrant uh baton mm. uh, just because he ran out of energy at, at mm -hmm. a point but you know i i definitely well musically i just i just learned that he was he was open to he was he was willing to consider anything you know mm. Uh, he could, you know, clamp down on it pretty quickly if he didn't like the way it sounded right away. But he wasn't like, he wasn't automatically closed off to any input. He was he was open to everything, which which was in some ways was was surprising to me. Yeah, uh, because it was is easy to believe pictures that had been painted of him as a tyrant, mm -hmm. or as a sort of uh, dictator or an autocrat. But but you know, and the reality of it is that he was just extraordinarily fond of music and and you know uh, uh, perceptive and uh, you know his, his awareness was tuned into the fact that music comes from all over and all possibilities need to be uh respected and and explored um and so it, it, the the fact that he didn't just like show up at rehearsal with a you know with a stack of scores and and say this is how it goes it's got to go down this way and that's that's the end of it mm -hmm. you know ev every rehearsal every sound check every gig was was an, an exploration of 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 possibilities you know from moment to moment and he and he was like really you know excited when there was when there was something in the in the audience that that would happen or say like somebody held up a sign or handed something to him that he could then incorporate into the uh, into the performance um or if ike willis said something you know funny in the middle of a song that made him you know, like he says in his book after the 80 the 1984 tour he lost uh, it was like the, the 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 latest tour that he lost six figures you know worth of money on because mm. You know, nobody was uh, subsidizing him, and 
the only way you can play this stuff is to rehearse for for four months before the tour starts so before the first gig he's already you know like many many dollars in the hole and then you go out and do a bunch of sold out shows and you're still in the hole you know because maybe you didn't sell as many shirts as you were expecting or who knows what but you know like we, we did a really successful tour sold out gigs and he still lost a shit ton of money and mm -hmm. and you know he just said oh, i can't do this anymore um but he was he, in his book he says that he had stopped touring uh because because of all this you know it just like it wasn't fun anymore he wasn't enjoying losing the money so he just went into his studio with the, the synclavier the, the the computer and, and he had total control over his music and the synclavier is never late for rehearsal the synclavier <laughs> doesn't do drugs the synclavier doesn't complain about catering you know it's it's just there and it's ready and and so for you know years he was absolutely delighted with uh with what the 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 complete control that he had but i think at a certain point he also got lonely and he said in the book uh yes the synclavier was giving me exactly precise uh performances of everything that i was composing but it was it unlike ike willis it wasn't just like suddenly saying we're beatrice in the middle of the song <laughs> and making me laugh so hard that i thought i was going to vomit you know it, it's it's yeah. it's like that unexpected thing the human element uh missing the relationship yeah exactly yeah. He, and and he just he just got missing it and 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 i'm and i was so fortunate that he decided to, that he needed more humanity again because that's the only reason i got in the band is because after you know, years of saying that he was never going to tour again. But I, I, I in fact, the, the first time I ever spoke to him was when I called him up at his office in 1985 because mm. it was announced that he was going to take phone calls in, in the office if you wanted to talk to Frank, call between oh, this shit. hour and this hour. Really? So then I was the last call that he took, actually like two minutes past the deadline. Oh, um, and, and, wow. And, and I said, uh, I said, you know listen it's 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 been my my dream to to play with you and he said well i'm never touring again so keep dreaming <laughs> <laughs> uh and then you know two years later I, I got in the band and uh did he keep your number or something or did he, or how did that no, happen no he, that, he I, it, it happened because i called the office again and asked for a job it's the only reason i got in oh the group. oh okay and, it, and, I, and i happened to call at a time that he needed a he needed a guitar player and a singer and a keyboard player. He wasn't necessarily <laughs> expecting them to all come in one guy, but that, but that week when he was like faced with the reality of needing to, to you know, replace these, these positions in the band, that mm -hmm. was the week that I called up and I talked to Jerry Fialka in the office and I'm grateful to Jerry Fialka for believing what I said, as opposed to just like saying, this guy's full of shit and, and right. you know, hiding it under a stack of papers. He told Frank, hey, this guy just called and, and says that he knows, you know, I, I, I don't think I claimed in the original call that I, that I knew every song, but, I, but I, I think that I, you know, said I'm familiar with all the material, you know, because I was a huge fan. I listened to it all the time mm -hmm. and I had a good ear and, and good memory retention. You know, it's, it's like if I hear a song enough times, I can I can make the, the connection in, in my brain that this chord goes to this chord and this melody note goes to that melody note. I just understand intervals intrinsically, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, which I think is being self-taught maybe uh, uh, allowed me to, to make those connections a, a little more effectively. And it just became a part of me. Mm. Um, and then, you know, and, and, and it was my ear that that Frank uh, really came to depend on a, a lot. Uh, but what that meant is that I could, you know, he he called me up the next day and said, you know, all my music. I don't believe you get your ass up here and prove it. <laughs> and then, you know, and at at the audition, he told me a couple of songs on the phone to, to prepare. But then at the audition, he was just naming songs just to check my my comprehension, my awareness of the whole catalog. And so he was just choosing songs from across the whole the whole panoply of his career. And and he kept choosing songs that I had never played before, but that I had heard so many times and that lived so strongly in my, mm. in my heart that I would just say, okay, give me a second. And I would, you know, I, would, I picked it out in front of him 
And then I'd say, okay, I think this is it. And then I, and, and even if it wasn't perfect, it was enough to demonstrate to him that yes, it did live in inside my mm. chemistry and, mm -hmm. and that, yeah. And give me a day to go home and listen to the record and, and drill down. Yes, I can play, I can really play the song for you. Um, and that was useful to him. So I ended up getting the gig. <laughs> That's so cool. I mean, even, yeah, I, like, I had read somewhere about that, that you were practicing melodies on the, in the car on the way to the, the, the thing. Yeah. And I was going to ask you, like, is that, were you practicing with a car, with, with a guitar or was that in your head? No, you in the, like with a guitar. I was in the, but my brother was driving from San Diego to, uh -oh. from LA, yeah, from San Diego to LA. I was in the back seat with the, with the guitar literally trying to play every Frank Zappa song in a two and a half hour drive and, and kind of freaking out. And it was the wisdom of my brother, Marty, that, that like calmed me down. He, he like, he pulled off the, the freeway and he just, and he stopped the car and he turned around and looked at me. This is a very, very strong moment in my life. And in my recollection, he looked at me and said, you're never going to be more ready than you are right this second. Mm. And, and, whether or not that's that was even true it felt true mm -hmm. yeah. and in, and in, and i honestly i believe it was true because you know everything all that i was doing in in this in this you know frantic uh uh attempts to to drag every frank zappa song from my subconscious up to my consciousness was was kind of pointless because it you know that that stuff did live inside of me the only reason why i was able to do that was because that stuff lived inside of me and and I, I think he was hip enough to realize that just the act of being in the room with Frank was going to do that same thing. He, it, it, mm. Frank asking me to do something was going to drag that up from my subconscious more effectively than me freaking out in the back of the car. Yeah. And, I, and I, you know, I, I just, I instinctively recognized this as, as wisdom and as truth. <laughs> and I put down the guitar and we, you know, I think we went out to In-N-Out Burger and, and, you know, and I just, I chilled out at that point. Mm. And, and I passed the audition. So I, 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 I feel like I have a lot to thank my brother for there. Hmm. That's so that's a great story, man. I love hearing that. That is like, I love, I love hearing about anybody getting to go work with one of their heroes or somebody they looked up to. And then at some point you get some recognition. I just love those stories because it seems because we prior, prior to the recognition of that, I'm sure there were so many years of listening to Zappa and checking out his stuff. You're just like, wow, man, this guy really does, you know, you're like, you had your own private world of understanding around this music. And then to hear the voice on the phone and, and, and like, wait, this is becoming a actual thing and it's crossing it's over. Awesome. And yeah, all, you know, all those years of what I just thought was, you know, hardcore geek fandom, you know, it turned out to be just like, you know, preparation or job prep. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> wow. Yeah. It's so, it's so exciting. And I just love hearing that. And, well, and so did did that kind of, and I'd imagine I mean, was it even though it was a short stint and towards the end of his life and career, uh, I mean that seems to have like in a lot of ways like you know launched you into the the the, the known universe for everybody else to go ah. Keneally, the guy that did the Zappa. Oh yeah, like get over here, do the thing. Yeah. Well, I mean, I I can't even. Who's to say what I'd be doing? You know, what what my life would be right now if 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 Jerry Fialka hadn't managed to convey <laughs> to Frank that that I had something to offer, and that and if Frank hadn't been sufficiently intrigued, even though he didn't believe it, to to you know check up on it. Mm. But yeah, I, I mean, the the next step was was. Uh, well, I mean, I, I was even after Frank passed, I, I couldn't, I couldn't, I couldn't tear myself away from the Zappa universe. It, it, it meant so much. It meant so much to me, and I was so sad of, with Frank's passing that I, I, I needed to maintain that connection with with Zappa, and so I ended up in in Dweezil and Amit's band for sure. like six years and then i was i made i went into steve vai's band where there was still that that zappa connection and you know and that was until the the end of the of the, of the beginning of the 2000s so in some ways i think I, I still stayed in that zappa matrix uh you know through dweezil and ahmed and then through vi you know because you know vi and i both have so much in common we're both you know long island dudes we both mm. you know, went through that that phase of being you know hardcore zappa fans transitioning into zappa band members and what what that does to your brain and it was like for for both of us it was so crazy to to be to be so into frank and then have your your professional music career 
begin with your dream coming true you Dude. know <laughs> it, that it, you mm. know in, in in one sense it's like the greatest thing that can happen and in another sense it's like it's the most disorienting thing because when it's done wh where do you go from here yeah and and uh so the the thing that made the most sense to me uh you know even though i you know continued you know working with dweezil and then working with steve because uh, you have to, you have to do stuff to make a living. You have to survive. But I also, you know, loved these. I loved playing their music. I loved being in Dweezil's band. That 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 band Z was so cool. It was so much fun. And back in those days when, when Dweezil and Amit were like still like a, a, a unit and mm -hmm. and you know, getting along and working together, it, that band just had an energy that was outrageous. One of the best live bands ever. We never were never able to capture that energy on record. But but those those Z gigs were fucking out of hand just mm. so good and then i loved playing with steve and i loved you know working with steve and being with steve and to this day steve is such a good friend and he's so supportive and cool um uh, but uh, you know the the question of after the the frank uh, you know era obviously came to an end was uh you know how do i how do i really honor frank you know how do I how do I take what's what I've just gone through and and really move forward and and the only way that made sense to me was to like really start focusing on on solo albums, sure. And and so while I was doing Dweezil and while I was doing Steve, I was you know creating a lot of music and I put out Hat and Boil at Dust Beck and Sluggo and and Knocker Tomp and Dancing. The first batch of solo albums were all created while I was playing in those other bands, and I formed Beer for Dolphins and did a bunch of gigs, and that was really where. You know, because you, it, it's there's there's two ways of looking at that question. Where do you go from here? One is the the more sort of calculated, career oriented thing. Okay, so you, you take whatever momentum of playing with Frank, which I quickly discovered was not a commercial momentum. It was it was a more of like a musician's momentum. When mm -hmm. when when a musician discovered you played with Frank, that meant something. It didn't mean anything to a record company guy. It didn't Street mean cred. Anything, yeah. Didn't mean anything to a radio station. Um, sure. So, you know, I, I disabused myself of any naive notions pretty early on, but the way to really honor Frank and the way to really, you know, take what I had learned and do something with it was just to start creating my own stuff in, in, in earnest. And, you know, when that began the, my solo career, which has gone simultaneously with all the other stuff that I've done. And to this day <laughs> remains a balancing act where it's like I, I want so much to be working on my solo album, but I, I, I rarely have time on any given day because I have work that I'm doing for other people, work that I need to take because this is survival mode that, sure. that we're all in right now. But I'm so grateful, you know, I'm so grateful that I can be here at home you know in in some ways I, I i i'm functioning you know much much more effectively in lockdown than than many people have the opportunity to uh so i i i'm you know every really every day i wake up grateful that i'm able to just walk in here and, and start working on music and actually yeah. you know supporting myself that way i'm so glad that that's the case for you man i i, I have to say i i found you uh, I'd heard your name before, but I, I, I didn't really know your body of work or anything until uh, I, I saw you on, uh, I think it was a G3 tour, uh, like when the first G3 videos came out and you had you were wearing a big ass hat and and it was like, who is this crazy dude with this hat that can shred just like Steve I and double all his stuff? And I remember calling uh, my buddy Ryan, I was like, who is this guy? who is this Keneally guy? And then like, this is like pre-internet where, you know, like I didn't, couldn't just Google it and find out. I was, it was like slowly over time, I started seeing your name more and more in all the Guitar World magazines and all this stuff. And um, and, and, then, and then then finding a couple of solo albums and having a buddy that was super into Zappa and you. And he was like, oh, you got to check out Sluggo. Oh, you got to check out this, you know? And I'm like, oh, okay, cool. <laughs> and it just, it, it was such an interesting thing uh, for me to find you because I just feel like, in my world, you came out of nowhere and Vi like introduced you to me or, you know, right. me to you, you know, and, um, just like he introduced Devin to you, I assume. Yeah. Oh my God. I remember when that Vi album, uh, came out and I remember the headbangers ball, like, like I, we used to, me and my buddy used to videotape VHS tape, all the headbangers ball so we could watch them over and over and over again mm -hmm. in case there was anything good on them. And there was, uh, thing with Ricky Rackman and Vi and Devin was on there being all weird and and we're like who is this weird 
bald guy with the the little ponytail thing like this is so weird and then that album dropped and we were like okay this is strangely good like we we're like <laughs> you no know, we were just couldn't we we're it kind of does this thing that we thought we and you know it just didn't fit any of the things like really it, really but, was, it was it was a a, a a left turn that that I, I think in some ways was like really kind of it, it was it, it forward thinking in a way uh, that 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 album mm -hmm. got into some stuff that didn't like uh hit the mainstream for a while oh uh, yeah yeah <laughs> well and and what the 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 biggest thing obviously is devin's voice like i remember like the songs were good like there were songs that i liked better than others and i like hearing steve play and the, all the other players on the album are fantastic but it was the tonal quality of devin's voice that i enraptured me i was like yeah. wait is he singing and screaming simultaneously with pitch and right. sounding badass? That, right. Who yep. does this exactly? Uh, like all those those uh, YouTube videos now of vocal teachers hearing Devin for the first time. It, it, oh, dude. <laughs> How can, like, you can't do that. What the hell? Yeah, You're yeah. not allowed. That's not physically possible. Well, <laughs> it exists in this one human being that we know of. So, <laughs> you know, you know, he's an anomaly. And I, I remember... Uh, you know, all these years later, I got to work with him in, in the early parts uh, of my, my career, like I made a guitar for him through Alvarez Guitars. And that's how we ended up kind of like becoming friends and doing that, uh, the gig in, in London uh, for the Ghost record. And um, I kind of had, even though it's very short, not at all the same thing, but I had my own version of that thing where I, here I was like I could, the first big gig I ever did with mm -hmm. somebody was somebody that I had been enamored with for a long time you know and i was like wow okay well i basically i basically can just like quit i was like in my mind i was like i quit now because like i don't necessarily nothing what am i gonna do I, I felt that driving home from my frank audition that that, <laughs> that, was, that was i was part of me was thinking i could just you know stop now <laughs> yeah like if, if i if my life ends prematurely you guys know why because i completed what i was supposed to do mm -hmm. you know here we are but then you know, I've been so thankful that it turned into a career and it turned into like a thing. And I just get to I get paid to hang out with people that are awesome and sort through like, what what do you guys what do you need? Did you need it in green? All right, I'll, I'll right see on. if we can do it in green. All right. Let's see. You That's know, my like, favorite Kiesel, by the way, is the green one. Then. Oh, I, well, I noticed you play that one the most. <laughs> yeah, I really love it. <laughs> do, you, do, you get, do you have it around there anywhere? Yeah. Is it close? Uh -huh. Oh yeah. It's so pretty. <laughs> oh, it's very pretty. And it's like man, that that shape is so uh so bad. I have a I have a oh look at that. And I love that it's just the top too. Um mm -hmm. that's so good. Yeah. Oh, and the purple heart in the back. Let's see that neck real quick on the back. Oh yeah. Mm. Is that like it's walnut and purple heart, I think, right? Yep. Yeah. yeah it's gorgeous. Uh, I love this thing. Hmm. I'm so glad that I'm so glad that you love it, man. I'm glad to do good things for Thank you. you. Thank you for. Yeah, of course. Yeah. Uh, I have a I have a I have a crescent on order right now that I can't wait. It's uh, I ordered. Uh, there's a finish that that we do called uh, we we do candy finishes, they call them, yeah. um, and it's over quilt maple, which uh, you got to pay extra for all that stuff. But it's like a it's a yellow candy, so it, okay basically over quilt maple you know the quilt part kind of gets knocks it down and gives it depth mm -hmm. and so it almost looks orange and then the rest of it's like this kind of yellow i can't yeah. wait till i'm just holding on waiting for <laughs> it's like another you know probably two months or something before i'll even see it but right on that's great it's one of those things um well i I could talk to you forever. Mike. This is the thing. We might have to do a part two down the road or something, but I, I, I really appreciate um, taking the time and I'm so glad to catch up with you and see you're, yeah, you're healthy sure. and you're doing well and you got all the work that you need at the moment. And, um, but I, I'm, I'm curious, do you, do you listen to music uh, while you're going and especially this work? Are, are you listening to other things or is it yeah, kind of I'm, like an insular, you know, no, I mean, and I, I think it part of it has to do with with just the the density of of a lot of the music that I'm working on, um, but it's like I'm I've been in this hardcore Neil Young phase, uh, oh, really? for months, and uh, and I don't know if if you're hip to his his website, which is uh, neilyoungarchives.com, but it's a it's a a, a membership 
uh, thing. Although right now is a, is a good time for you to check it out or for anybody mm. to check it out because you can, you, I believe he's giving, he's granting access to the whole site, uh, even, even for non-members. But basically it's his, it's his, his entire career laid out on a timeline um, both, you know, all the released stuff plus a bunch of stuff that is like alternate, uh, you know, unreleased material, some live material, videos, uh, a, a, like a, a, a newspaper which is updated all the time. Uh, wow. Uh, and and in astonishingly good audio quality, you know, like the the the, the best possible audio quality that that streaming can offer. Uh, and it's laid out in this really eccentric, not necessarily easy to to grok graphic uh, <laughs> framework that just feels very Neil. But there's just something of, about the sound of his guitar and his voice and the way he mm. he writes and the the emotions that he conveys. That I mean, it's 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 meant a lot to me for you know coming up on on 50 years now, um, even more so whenever, whenever cinnamon girl came out, I guess I was eight, seven or eight years old. And I heard that song on the radio. I recognized that as a sound that really meant something to me. Um, and, uh, he's just done so many albums, so much music that I love. So that's that, that, you know, it's like, what am I listening to? Neil Young <laughs> almost exclusively. That's awesome, man. That's, I'm, also, I'm glad also, also Christmas music because my wife and I are, <laughs> are hardcore Christmas geeks. So we are, we, we definitely have <laughs> the tree going and we've got the, the, the lights on the, on the stairs. And I, you can even, I think, see some out. Oh outside. yeah. Yeah. <laughs> did, did uh, Neil do any Christmas music? So did you cross, are you able to cross the two? Um, no, I have. I I don't think there's a Neil Young Christmas song. Damn, that's it. That, that, I'm, <laughs> it would be like I, I would never have to listen to music again if I, <laughs> those two worlds crossed. I saw Neil uh, live. Uh, man, it's probably been seven, eight years ago or something like that. I got invited to a gig out, outside of Seattle, and I always knew that I liked Neil, and I I, I didn't listen to his whole catalog or anything like that. But I was like, ah, oh, man, like he's a legend. I gotta go see this show, right? And I. Mm -hmm. Went to that show and did not expect to be just like slayed. Like I was, that, was, was, that, was that a Crazy Horse show? Uh, yeah, yeah. It was. A, it was crazy, and he had just all the amps. Like the, the stage setup alone, the fact that the guy must have had like two extra semis to cart around these vintage amps and guitars, and <laughs> and and had them set up all perfectly, all like tiered down in the back. Like the back it was so. I was so enamored with that. Awesome. And and then you know. You, you then you realize oh wait this guy's got all these very recognizable songs that you know very you know through all spanning all these decades and and then he picks up that black les paul and he kicks in the dirt and you, i I, just, I get chills thinking about it right now i'm like yeah. who is this guy and that <laughs> voice you know like i i didn't know that i was a big i just like it was like a a a, a a, a dormant awesome. thing in me, you know, that, that just awakened <laughs> that night. And I was like, oh, shit, I'm, I'm, I love Neil Young, like, way more than I thought. That's awesome. Yeah, it love was that. incredible. I, I hope that we get to see him do something live again before. Uh, it's, it's interesting. <laughs> he's, 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 he's putting out a lot of archival stuff. He just put out this the second uh, box set of, of the, the, the Neil Young archives. Uh, the first one came out 11 years ago, and it's, it's just like mm. this huge thing that and it's it sold out instantly so they had to do a second run which i think starts shipping in march um but the second one covers the era uh from 1972 to 1976 which was in uh, a lot is like in some ways like the weirdest but also the best period of his career he because mm. he was coming off of the success of the album harvest which was this the album with with the heart of gold on it which was mm -hmm. his biggest, like kind of in some ways his his one real huge mainstream success song and uh and uh he uh just like completely turned in the opposite direction it, it was referred to he he referred to it once as uh the, at, during this period, I, I, I started driving in the di in the ditch. It was a, it was a, it was a rougher ride, but you saw more interesting things there. Mm, um, <laughs> I like that. Yeah. <laughs> so the, this covers the ditch period of of, of his career, and uh, and just like and but also he was so productive. He was writing so much and recording so much, and only a fraction of it came out on records at the time. So you listen to this 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 new uh, archival collection and and. In, within the first five songs, there's like two unreleased songs that are like so freaking good they they could have come out and didn't. Um, 
he's just a, a real eccentric dude and, mm -hmm. and more than almost anybody beholden only to his vision you know it zero concern for commercial considerations it's just mm. this is what i feel like doing he's the he's the kind of guy who in the, in the middle of a tour with with steven stills realized that he wasn't having a good time and just left the tour <laughs> And uh, and he left a note for uh, for Stephen Stills that just said, "Funny how some things that start out spontaneously end that way." Eat a peach, Neil. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I didn't know that story. That's <laughs> awesome. <laughs> I see a reoccurring theme here, though. Like, like people that uh, you know, you were, you know, Frank was in that vein in a lot of ways, right? Like, I mean, very yeah. very little concern. I mean, I, I think he was concerned. He seemed to be concerned with success on some level, but but he was you know, he was concerned with. Like we had this conversation uh, right at, shortly after I got in the band and like, he introduced me over to, to the, he invited me over to the house to like listen to, to music in his basement, mm. uh, which even after I left the band, I was so desperate really to maintain contact with him that I would go over to the house whenever I could. And, and he was working on a lot of albums simultaneously and, and becoming more ill. So he was just home working all the time. And Mm. He, he would you know, allow me to come over and listen to the stuff that he was working on. And I, I treasure those memories as much as, as touring with him. Um, but he, the first time I went over to the house and he just said, people who come to these shows expect to have their minds blown. They, they, they expect to be blown away. You know, they've, they've come to, you know, formulate in, in their heads what it means to go to a, a, a Zappa show. And uh, he said, I take it very seriously. I want those people to leave that 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 mm. show not believing what what they've seen. That's, you know, and, and, you know, he often said that he had an audience, his audience consisted of one person, which was himself. And if he was satisfied, then then he just presumed that other people would like it. And, th and that is true. But he also took his job very seriously. And he would say, the audience is my boss. Like, I, yeah. I'm, I'm the boss of my band. Some band members who are just like used to being in a band and just like grooving behind it and, and uh, you know, and going with the flow and everything. And, and he said, you know, th let there be no doubt about it. I'm, I'm, I'm not your buddy. I'm not your dad. I'm your boss. <laughs> you know, this mm. This is you. You're being paid to do a job here, and I, I, because I'm the guy signing your check, I expect you to do that job. Unlike a lot of bands, where you know it's like if you're too wasted to play the song right, oh well, you know it's just like that right. deal. That's not going to fly here. Um, so he was the boss of the band, but the audience was the boss of Frank. And I, and I thought that's that was like a real, hmm. real sober-minded and and totally understandable way of of looking at that equation. Yeah, and he he seemed to, like I, I you said that uh, in his those times in the basement, like I I had heard multiple different people say that uh, as he knew about the sickness and as he got more ill, he almost doubled down and like tried to write more simultaneously and try to put out or try to capture more things so that he would leave those last bits. Yeah, well, he was he was he had gone back to writing on the Sinclair and he was he was working on what was really like the final masterwork, which was an album called Civilization Phase Three, which, uh, you know, is some of it is, is played by the Ensemble Modern, which is this, you know, this band that that uh, asked Frank if, if if he was willing to work with them this incredibly talented chamber orchestra and, and it's, his, his performances with, with this ensemble are some of the most moving things in the documentary that just came out because he was very, very ill. And, and he'd had so many, uh, he had, had had so many disappointing orchestral experiences uh, where, you know, there wasn't enough rehearsal time and it ended up costing him time and money and energy and sweat and to end up with a you know non-accurate performance of his music uh and in this case here's the ensemble modern saying we will we will ourselves pay our way to come to los angeles to rehearse with you and work with you and we we want to honor you we want to honor your music and this ended up being frank's last live music experience i was on the last rock tour but the last live music experience that frank participated in was this uh, this concert this chamber music concert called the yellow shark which uh, came out as a, as a CD, and uh, and so this, but this other album, which is which is called the uh, 
it's called Civilization Phase Three. There, the second disc especially has some improvised textural stuff with the ensemble mode, Darren. But pretty much all the composed stuff is computer music. It's him working with the synclavier, mm. and it's and it's it really feels like a, a, just like an X-ray of Frank's soul <laughs> to listen to this because he was crafting it so specifically and making these little minute adjustments every single day, just like getting these strange textures and amazing, impossible melodic uh, phrases that couldn't be played by humans. Uh, the only way he could get accurate performances of this stuff that he was feeling was, was through the computer. Mm. Uh, and, and there's a, a piece at the end of, of disc one called N light and and it it, it it feels in some ways like, a, I mean, the whole thing feels like a summing up. It's got a bunch of spoken stuff, a bunch of narrative stuff. And if you read along with the booklet, it's this whole crazy, surreal story. And it ends uh, with, a, with a piece called Beat the Reaper. And then uh, it, it, the very final piece is this sort of sound painting called Waffenspiel which uh has like the sounds of of automatic uh uh like machine gun fire that was happening uh, in his neighborhood that he recorded uh whoa uh and then like like uh, this is it's it's overlaid with the sound of just like the night with crickets and stuff and then this this crazy sound of uh, of like a jet fighter flying overhead it's 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 somehow it's like extremely moving uh and and this this one piece is called N Light, which he played me, it, in on the album the final version of the album it's eighteen minutes he played me a, a a version of it in in process which was about twenty four minutes so it had an extra six minutes of stuff, and some of it was just like just heartbreakingly beautiful like some of the most incredibly just like purely beautiful music I'd ever heard from him because obviously he was his music could be proudly ugly at times right sure he yeah. was happy very happy to explore that ugliness mm -hmm. um but this music was just like you know it would it would take a harmonic turn that would just like tear your heart up and then it would twist it even more it would get like even more beautiful it was, it was like unbelievable i'm like oh my god and when it was done i said to him frank that's uh, that's honestly some of the most beautiful music i ever heard from you and his response to that was Yep, I got to put some more ugly stuff in there. <laughs> oh it, man, it, it didn't feel properly balanced to him. Sure, it, sure. His view of the world, you know, it, it's like this is this is too nice. It doesn't. That's that's not that's not the way things really are. Uh, so I'm just I'm just grateful that I was able to hear it at that moment because you know it, it really was just like exalted stuff, you know, divine sounding stuff. Mm. The version that's on the album is also absolutely gorgeous, but it's uh, it's also a bit more uh, uh, ugly. <laughs> you've, you, well, you've really piqued my interest on these particular recordings. I'm going to go back and listen to these because uh, I've listened. I've already, you know, honestly listened to mostly the more popular things, and like later catalog uh, hasn't been something that I've re really taken any time for, to be honest. So, yeah. Um, uh it's, uh, just as a, uh, if, you, if you want to uh, dip your toe in the deep end of the pool, uh, give Civilization Phase Three a try and see. Oh yeah, see how that, that sounds very interesting to me, and and just because of hearing your story, and and I have to say, man, it's really, I feel so fortunate to 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 be connected to you and to to get to hear these stories from you, and and like, in a way, because you 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 remained uh, a fan throughout and 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 had these heightened experiences with the man himself and then still recount them with your own personal like passion and 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 awe and i think that's like that says so much about your experience with him and how you're still connected to it i mean obviously i know you were, you've still been playing his music with the hologram tour and stuff like that and connected to the weasel and all this but it just it, it it it's just a marker for me to to witness you being um in that place and to see see the authenticity you know come through with how you describe it and the experience so thank you for sharing oh you're welcome and i appreciate you saying that and i'm i'm 
I'm hopeful. We're all hopeful because th this this year uh, we were supposed to the Zappa band minus the hologram. We're, we're supposed to go out on the road opening for King Crimson. Oh. And uh, obviously that was a, you know, a very disappointing thing that that wasn't able to happen. But they've rescheduled the tour for precisely one year later. So mm. I guess it'll be like May, June, July of, of next year. And mm -hmm. uh that's right on the precipice, you know. It, yeah. It, it, that's I, that, that sounds kind of optimistic to me, at 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 this stage. But sure. You know, hoping. Well, in twenty twenty uh, time, that that's only three years away. You know, like <laughs> as, as slow as this I year has gone I just, by. I, I've 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 experienced it simultaneously as like it, it, it gone by in a flash and also uh, endless. It, it's the, the time is True. Just a strange construct this year. It really is. Well, uh, I'll, I'll leave it here and I say thank you so much, Mike. Um, thank you. I, I hope that you continue to be happy and healthy and productive in thank all things. You. And thank you for being uh, uh, a voice of reason and, and you know, like and, and, and being and finding your own center and then um, be an example for that. Because, you know, that's just what each one of us, I think, is called to do, especially in trying times. So I appreciate you. Uh, you know, collecting yourself and being able to hear multiple different uh, points of view and, you know, remaining friends with people and being a human out there. <laughs> <laughs> I really appreciate that. Thanks, Chris, man. Yeah. Thank you. Hope you have a really great day. I'll talk to you real soon, Mike. All right. Take All care. Right. Take care, brother. Bye-bye.